Well, we're continuing our review of the topic Beyond Time and Space. It's one of a series that we collectively will call the boundaries of our reality. And uh, so, and uh, we use this peculiar picture there just as a title thing, and people have asked, what is that? It's kind of a weird collection of things. That's a Kalabayao manifold. And I know you've always wanted to see one of those. What is that? That's a complex manifold that are higher dimension analogies of K3 surfaces. And what's the K3 surface? That's a complex, algebraic, smooth, minimal, complete surface that is regular and has trivial canonical bundles. And uh, in superstring theory, the extra dimensions of space-time are sometimes conjectured to take the form of a six-dimensional Kalabi-Yau manifold, which led to the idea of mirror symmetry. And they were named the Kalabi-Yau spaces after E. Kalabi, and, uh, who first studied them, and S. T. Yau, who uh, proved that Kalabi conjecture that they have Ricci flat metrics. Now, if you understood a single word of that, you are obviously in very on the cutting edge of advanced mathematics. And uh, if you want a shortcut to find out what those things mean, you can just go on the internet and use Wikipedia and check it out. You'll quickly discover your armpit deep in an extreme, extremely advanced form of mathematics. But I just was intrigued with that manifold, so I used it as a title slide. Several people asked me what it was, so I figured I owed you an explanation. But I can assure you, not a single word of what's on this slide will occur on the final exam, okay? So relax. But last time we talked a lot about gravity and space-time, and uh, we mentioned that, that the influence of gravitational forces um, from the, uh, occur from the for curvature of space-time. In other words, one, the way you can remember this, space tells matter how to move. That's what creates what we notice as gravity. Matter tells space how to curve. And the curve, in other words, the whole idea of gravity and the curvature of space-time are intimately linked. And uh, so, but what's interesting about the study from last time, I'm just going to hit a few highlights from last time, is that the uh, Hubble telescope is used, is looking for the missing matter. And one of the things, if you read in this area, you quickly discover that everything we know about the universe in terms of its physics of matter and energy, we, l we know from only a 5% sample. We can tell that there is 95% of the mass of the universe that's invisible. That's why they call it dark matter. You can, in ast astronomical terms, you can't see it because it's dark. But they can't find it. They know it's there because it shows up mathematically in, in a number of ways. And so they're trying to, there's a huge search going on in the field of astronomy of looking for what they call the mass matter. And that's not important to you and I, except to realize that it, we, what we know it comes from a 5% sample. And you would think that we'd travel those hallways with just a little more humility. The, the prof professors and astronomers and astrophysics talk as if they know. No, we should be talking as if we infer but we're inferring from a, actually a surprisingly small sample. Same thing's true in, bio, in uh, biology. As we study the DNA, most of what you've heard about the DNA genome and so forth is from a 5% sample, by the way. That's a whole other study. We're getting off the track. Let's go ahead here. As we explore our reality, as we're doing the study, time and space, and we talked about the stretching of space and all that last time, we begin to realize there's part of the world that is out of our reach. And uh, I'm going to, and this may have some relationship to the spirit world. In fact, 95% of the mass of the universe is missing, and the search for cold, dark matter continues. And that leads to the thing, you know, we suddenly realize as we read the scripture, there are aspects to reality that we don't normally encounter. Uh, angels are one of them. And uh, Elisha's servant has that strange experience in 2 Kings 6. You know, the, the, the servant wakes up in the morning and they're surrounded by the enemy. And he's panicked. And Elijah very, I mean, he says, Lord, show him. And he sees that they're really surrounded by chariots of fire. And uh, so it's one of those rare places in the scripture where someone is given a glimpse of a broader reality beside the reality that we sense ourselves. There's also a case where one angel, after dinner one night, slaughters 185,000 Assyrians. Not Syrians, Assyrians. Second Kings 19. And that's, if nothing else, it tells you, you don't mess with angels. Right? 
185,000. That's, that's huge. And then, of course, there's the whole issue of Exodus, chapters 9 through 12, all the plagues of Egypt and all of that business. And the Sodom and Gomorrah, 19, there's a, an inter intervention in their lives from outside what we normally think of as reality. We even hear, we always think of guardian angels, you know. I always used to think that guardian angels was just some kind of colorful little uh, uh, euphemism we use for children. I was surprised in Matthew 18, it speaks of them. Yes, there really are angels assigned. And if, if I have one, I know he works overtime, you know, okay. And we know that a third of the angels are hostile. They're, they fell with Satan, and according to Revelation 12 and other passages. So, uh, so there is a spirit world, and I'm not suggesting that that's isomorphic with the missing mass necessarily, but the fact that we only experience the physical world with a 5% sample, it sort of dovetails, at least in my mind, to realize there's, there is part of our reality that is not directly perceptive by us, except on occasion. And uh, so, and... Uh, then, of course, we have this whole business of the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, these, 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 fallen, these fallen angels in Genesis 6 that led to the Nephilim and all of that. So, uh, so there is, not only are there angels, there's angelic warfare going on. In Daniel 10, we get one of those glimpses of this world outside our normal reality because this, this uh, angel comes to give Daniel a message, but he's held up by a power that he calls the Prince of Persia, not the physical Persia, the prince, the power that's behind the prince of Persia. And that held him for uh, uh, several weeks. And he says, once I give him a message, I've got to go back because the prince of Greece is coming. So you discover that these labels he's using correlate with empires of that time. But there's 200 years between those, by the way. But, uh, and we get a glimpse then of this spirit world in which God dispatches an angel to give Daniel a message. Daniel goes into fast and prayer for couple of, for three weeks, I guess it was, and uh, it took this messenger three weeks to get through the adversity he faced. So we not only know there's a, another reality outside our reality, but it's a hostile environment. Wow. And of course, who is the god of that world? Satan. And, uh, and uh, so, and we know we have personal warfare. Paul warns us in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor, not just a few pieces, the whole armor. And he goes in, and, and every one of you, I encourage you to check out Ephesians 6 from verse 10 to 17 and, and understand the weapons that are available to you. In fact, without them, you're going to be a sitting duck. And we're right in the battleground ourselves. We sense it. We're not talking about gunfire and bombs. We're talking about deceit versus truth. Never in my uh, Awareness. I've been a Christian for over 60 years, and I cannot remember ever a time when the environment is more deceitful than it is today. You can't believe anybody. Lies, deceit everywhere. And, and, and in fact, we live in a culture that denies truth. I grew up, and I remember my, my parents who came from, the, from uh, Europe, you know, the dream of going to college was to learn, to, to learn truth. Life, science was a quest for truth. And we live in a culture which denies its existence. There's no truth. You have your truth, I have mine. You know, the, the relativism is nonsense. It's an undermining of the whole pursuit of truth. And are we surprised that the media is, is corrupt and, and so forth? So we were plunged into evolutionism, humanism. These are all anti-God points of view. Well, we've been exploring as we move around in this area what I call the boundaries of reality, our reality, I'm, put, I'm using Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man as a symbol of, of representing our anthropic reach, if you will. And last time, and I'm using size horizontally at the bottom, large being to the, on the right side of the diagram, small being at the left. And last time we explored bigness and uh, largeness, if you will. And uh, astronomy, astrophysics, the universe, that's, we, we talked about that a little bit last time. The main discovery on the largeness side was that the universe is finite. It's not infinite. And that, that's the biggest discovery of 20th century science. It's it might be expanding, but it's, it's finite. And that's a shock. And we demonstrated how we know it is last time. I won't go through that all again. So this time we're going to go the other way. We're going to explore smallness. Okay? And uh, this is going to plunge us into the study of what's called quantum physics. 
subatomic particles. And we're going to study smallness. And, and it also is astonishingly finite. And that's going to be more mysterious to us than the fact that the universe is finite. And let, we'll go into this here. We discover that everything, length, mass, energy, time itself, are composed of indivisible units called quanta. And uh, I want to demonstrate what that means. That should, that'll be, let's back up a minute, though. When we were in school, we probably indulged in one of the models of an atom. The typical one, we'll use hydrogen, the simplest atom. It's got a nucleus and it's got an electron energy level around it. And uh, the, the, the nucleus in the center, the electrons on the outside. Now, this is obviously not to scale, okay? If we were to um, build a scale model of this electron, or this uh, atom, hydrogen atom, and we used a golf ball to represent the nucleus, the electron that we'd have spinning around it would be three football fields away. Okay? Just to give you a flavor of this thing. Now, we know that the atom itself is in the neighborhood of 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Point zero 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 eight eight zero zero eight. Yeah, point, it's a very, very tiny part of a centimeter. Okay? The nucleus of that, that's the whole atom. The nucleus is 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Much smaller. 13 zeros, okay? The important part isn't the absolute number. They're obviously very small. The important thing is the ratio between them. In other words, um, whatever the nucleus is, the electron is 100,000 times that size in radius. You follow me so far? That's linear. 10 to the fifth. 10 to the fifth, that's 100,000. Bear with me here. If I make the nucleus a golf ball, okay, the electron is, oh, excuse, I said football field, three miles away, right? Three miles away. So if we were going to build a model, we have an ambitious project. If we make the nucleus as big as a golf ball, our electron has to be three miles away. That's just the linear distance. Follow me through. That doesn't talk about the area that it goes. What do I do to get the area? I square it, don't I? So if, what I, if the area ratio then would be 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 5th, or the other way of saying it, 10 to the 5th squared, or 10 to the 10th, the area. Except the molecule isn't planar, it's three-dimensional, isn't it? So we have to go a third dimension, so we have to have the volumetric ratio would be <coughs> 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 5th, or put another way, 10 to the cube, or 10 to the 15th. You say, well, what, what, so I, I, what do all these numbers have to do? I just wanted to get you a flavor of what we're dealing with here, is that if I have a model of an atom, the ratio of the part that's solid, so to speak, the nucleus, to the volume that it represents as an energy field and so forth, has a ratio of one part to 10 to the 15th, volumetrically. Are we together so far? Let me dramatize what that may mean to you. That has the same ratio as one second does to 30 million years. So if I said that, let's just use this podium as an example. If I said this podium is solid, and one of you said, there's nothing here at all, it's empty, you're more correct than I am by the same ratio. Okay? The solidness here is, has the same ratio to the, 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 the podium itself as one second has to 30 million years. Why does it feel solid? Because the atoms here are an electrical collision with the atoms of my hand, so it feels solid. You follow me? It has all those physical properties, but it's really accrues because of an electrical simulation. Okay? The electrons are negative. Other ne the, the, it's the collision of those molecules that create the appearance of it being solid. But it's mostly empty. What do you mean mostly? Well, that ratio, one to... 30 million, one second to 30 million years. That sounds, do the math sometime. It's astonishing. So that is, this, uh, is, is it empty space. See, conjecture two is more descriptive than one by the same ratio. It's more empty space than solid by a ratio of one second to 30 million years. And so that's, I want you to get a feeling for this illusion that we call solidity, if you will. 
Now, what we discover as we start examining things, we discover that everything we run into is made up of indivisible units. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's assume I have a piece of string that's of whatever length you choose. I can cut that in half, obviously, and end up with half of what I had, right? No problem. I can take what's left and cut that in half, right? And do that again. And I can keep doing that, and you would think that I can keep doing that. It might get so small that I can't really do it. It's not empty, but it, conceptually, whatever I've left over, you figure I can cut in half, right? Wrong. It turns out well, I can keep doing that until I get to a distance of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And then I discover if I try to cut that in half, that thing is throughout the entire universe at the same instant. It loses a property that physics, physicists call locality. It is no longer local. And they actually prove this in a laboratory experiment that every photon knows is connected with every other photon in the universe immediately, faster than the speed of light. And that's, that shatters many fundamental concepts in physics. It turns out, I've described it here in terms of length, it's also true of time. Time is made up of units. 10 to the minus 43 seconds is the unit of time. There is no unit of time smaller than that. It's very small, but there's nothing smaller than that. That's a unit of time. There's units of length, Mass, energy, and time are, 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 are the example is, you know, on a violin, you can get any, town, any tone you want by where you fret it, right? It's, it's variable. A piano gives you only the keys that you hit. You can look at it in that sense, it's digital. We discover the universe is digital. It, 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 and that turns out to have some profound significance. There are two concepts that we can talk about in mathematics, but we discover don't show up in the universe. One is randomness, and uh, the other one is infinity. Those are terms we use a lot. Um, uh, the, the, the infinity uh, in the macrocosm would say that we have a universe that's infinite, except we know that we have a finite universe. There is no infinity in astronomy. We can talk about it mathematically. We can't find it physically on the big side. The shock is that we can't find it on the small side either. There's a limit to smallness. Anything you talk about, length, mass, energy, or time, there's a limit to how small, because it, it's granular. It, it's made up of indivisible units. That's what we call them quanta. Now, uh, and so that's what the, the, so we discover that we are, and I, 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 the randomness thing, uh, there's a new field of mathematics called chaos theory. They discover that there, you cannot get your hands on something that's truly random. It's very elusive, and that's a whole other study. But the point is, um, we discover now that you and I are within a digital simulation. And that's a disturbing discovery. That re what we think is reality is really a simulated environment. It's almost like a, like a virtual game or something that we find ourselves in. Okay? So, okay, we've talked about these. It's as if that this whole world that we experience has finite limits, and it's a digital simulation. Now, it's interesting that Scientific American in June of 2005 ran an article that included this as a conclusion, that our universe appears to be but a shadow of a larger reality. Now, that's not a philosopher talking. That is the Scientific American's conclusion from the fact that our constants in physics seem to be changing. And if they're changing, Maybe not much, but they imply that the real reality is something larger than we're experiencing. And uh, wow. There's a movie that came out some years ago. It, didn't, was, it was eclipsed by Matrix and some more, more popular movies, so a lot of people don't even know of its existence, but it came out. It was called The 13th Floor. It has nothing to do with the story, like so many of those titles. It just happened to it's a computer story, and the computer that's involved was on the 13th floor of a building. It's just an arbitrary title. But I wanted to mention this because it's it, not that it's a great movie, don't misunderstand me, but it deals it, it, with some scientists that in, in, two, in nominally 2005 in Los Angeles that have a supercomputer and build a super video game, so to speak, a super software system. And what they attempted to do is to create a mathematical description of Los Angeles in 1937. 
they created a virtual environment, sort of like a video game, if you will, with great detail, and it, they populated this virtual environment with virtual people. And the idea is, in this science fiction type story, is that a participant could get into this machine and exchange his consciousness with one of the program units, as they called them, and live in that world for maybe an hour, okay? And be in L.A. in 1937, it would seem. And all this is in the flavor of a, a super video game, in a sense, okay? And so the virtual people they call program units. In L.A., they have real people, of course. And the game is that real people can go there and transfer consciousness through this gimmick and, and uh, be in that environment. Except the problem is there's a murder that takes place. The head of the project gets murdered, and the number two guy is getting framed for the murder. And so he's shook up by that, of course, as he begins to discover what's going on here. And he realizes, for some reason I won't bore you with, that the answer is he's got to go into L.A. 1937, and there's a, a note that's been given the bartender by his boss that he has to retrieve that will solve his mystery. And so he does that, of course. And I won't go over the whole story here, but it turns out that some other people show up in the story, and they apparently are from outside L.A. 2005. And there's some plot twists and other things. I don't want to spoil the story for you. But the interesting thing is the shock that occurs to our hero in the story and his friends is they discover they're not real people either. That the real people came into this from 2025 and that they are virtual people in a virtual environment. And they try to adjust to that discovery. And there's some cute twists about the story where the, it, 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 has, it has integrity from a plot structure point of view. But the point is, what makes this, the reason I may even make reference to this, it's sort of a, a microcosm, if you will, or it's just an entertainment piece, that deals with exactly where we are. We are in a digital environment that's simulated. And we also know that we are subject to those limitations of that environment, but our reality exceeds that. And we get visited by people, whether we call them angels or something else, whatever, from an, a larger reality outside. The parallel is astonishing. So I just share that with you to stretch, not because it's a good movie, I'm going to try to push that, but just to stretch your imagination to realize the predicament we find ourselves in is the same as these people did, that we are in a virtual environment, not a real one. And, and uh, there's a designer that's given us a handbook and tells us what to do about it. And it's interesting that uh, the Apostle John, in his first letter, we call the Epistle of John, he has an interesting statement in chapter 3, verse 2. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He, Christ, when He shall appear, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. That's a wild statement. Whatever peculiar dimensionality Jesus enjoys today, and it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a hyperdimensional form of existence because he can enter and leave a six-sided space without piercing any of the six sides because he shows up, and, and he's not a phantom. He says, handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. Whatever, that incredible existence he had, we know that we will be like him because we shall see him as he is, not a representation of him. We will see him as he is. That's what... This is actually a physics statement, or hyperdimensionality statement that John makes here in, in chapter 3. So, I want to give you another example of some strange linkage between our physical universe and the biblical text. That it turns out that scientists are concerned because they're beginning to realize that the constants of physics are not constant. They may be changing. And I got a number of stories about that, but I'll pass it for here. And, of course, the Scientific American thing I just quoted here, that, that three, our three-dimensional existence is a shadow of a larger reality. That's what the Bible has said all along in the first three verses of, he, of uh, uh, Hebrews 11, 1 Corinthians 15, all deal with this issue. But I want to talk about, there are, among the constants of physics, there are some that are dimensionless, meaning they're ratios that have no dimension. They're true whether in inches or yards or miles, okay? And... Uh, there are two constants in the universe, at least, we know two of them, that are dimensionless. In other words, they have no dimension. I'll give you a show what they are. One of them is pi. When you're in school, you discovered the ratio of the diameter of the circle to the circumference is a fraction that is a precise number. We usually use 
22 sevenths as an approximation in school or whatever. But if you're in engineering, you probably use 3.14159, and uh, uh, depending on how precise you want to be, okay? And uh, so uh, uh, that's pi. The other dimensionless ratio you probably have not run into unless you've been in engineering or advanced math. And that's the base of a natural logarithm, the log of e. e. This peculiar number e is another number like pi. It's dimensionless, but it has some very peculiar properties. Therefore, it's very important in mathematics. Well, let's back up a minute. If we want to talk about the creation, there are two verses in the Bible that are pivotal for the creation. Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1. I want to take a look at Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1 with a new light here. Genesis 1-1, first verse, 24, uh, 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 28 letters, 7 words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. How many knew that? If you know that verse, there's not another problem in the Bible that'll bother you. If you really understand that verse, it'll answer everything else. But in any case, let's take a look at this verse in Hebrew. Now, you know, Hebrew goes from right to left. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. All nations east of Jerusalem go from right to left. All nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. But anyway, the point is, Hebrew and Greek have the peculiar characteristic that every member of their alphabet has a numerical value. And that's a peculiar property of those two languages only. Some Roman letters have some values, but it's only six of them, and that's another whole story. Anyway, Hebrew and Greek. Okay, it turns out, there's a strange thing that's been discovered. If you take the, the number of letters times the product of the letters and you divide that by the number of words and the product of the words, understand, since each of those letters has a numerical value, you can go through the rigmarole and pulling that together. How many letters are there? Well, it happens to be at 28, I believe. And uh, what's the product of them? You multiply that out, you get a number. You take the number of words times the product of the words well, okay, you go through that rigmarole and you discover something very strange. You, come, you get pi to four decimal places. That's precise, by the way. That's more precise than most of us bothered to use unless you were in an engineering curriculum. 3.1416. Four decimal places. Precision. You say to yourself, well, that's kind of weird. Somebody must have had time on their hands to even discover that. Right? And so, so what? Okay, that, that, I'll, I'll leave you that. And that's, of course, pi. Now, there's a guy by the name of John Napier. He's a mathematician in the 16th century. He's the discoverer of, what we, of, of uh, logarithms. And there's a certain kind of logarithm that has properties that cause it to show up everywhere in mathematics. So they call it a natural logarithm, or some people in his honor called Napierian logarithms after John Napier. And he also was the one that promoted the use of decimal point in fractions. He happens to be an activist for the Reformation in the Protestant affairs in Scotland, incidentally. That's a small footnote in some of the scientific texts, but I thought it'd be interesting to include here. The point is, this E discovered E, which is this peculiar number in mathematics. The number is most commonly defined as the limit of an expression, 1 plus 1 over n, uh, and as n becomes large, it, it's, it's defined by an expression. It has some, and its limiting value is 2.718281828, and so on. Um, uh, now, why is it so important in mathematics? Because it happens, it has some peculiar mathematical properties. The number E forms the base of the natural and Napierian logarithms. Where do you find it? In wave mechanics, it's a very key formula. In electrical theory, it shows up again and again. In advanced math, it's the sum of the, cos uh, it's got a uh, irrational part of the uh, trig functions. It's got uh, distribution of prime numbers follow that behavior. The fact that prime, a distribution of prime numbers follow any behavior is bizarre, but it does ha it describe the distribution of prime numbers. It's defined by that limit that I just mentioned, and it's usually approximated by 2.718281828 and so on. Okay, so much for that. We talked about Genesis 1.1 as that one verse. Let's go to John 1.1. That's the other pivotal verse for creation. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Let's take a look at that in the Greek. Okay? If you look at that in the Greek, again, Greek, every letter has a numerical value. We're going to do the same thing we did with Genesis 1.1. We're going to take the number of letters times the product of the letters and divide that by the number of words times the product of the words. And what we get is E to four decimal places. Now, you say, if you've been following this, 
that has to stir the back of the neck here. That is too weird to be coincidental. Not the four decimal places. The precision there is staggering. The significance of both of these, they are the dimensionless constant of the universe, and they're embedded in the biblical text. How do you explain that? You can't. You can shrug it off, well, it's just a weird coincidence, except you start doing the math of that coincidence, and it's ridiculously absurd. I mean, it's just, that, that's designed. Why? Why is there this, and uh, by the way, there's probably dozens more like this that link the constant of the universe to the biblical text that we've yet to discover. But these are so latent, they're, I mean, a patent that they're out there. I want to shift gears here a little bit, though. We uh, are guilty of making linear assumptions in a nonlinear world. The minute we discover that the world is digital, that makes it by definition nonlinear. It's made up of discrete pieces. Um, see, it's sort of like having all the parts to a piano and trying to put it together so it makes sense. You with me? You're still digital, right? Linear assumptions. We all assume everything linearly. It's just intrinsic, of course. We think tomorrow will be like yesterday. Next week like last week. Next month like last month. That's making linear assumptions. Now we do that because it's practical, and yet in our heart of hearts we realize that there's a risk here of running into a nonlinearity. And uh, we want to understand what we mean by that. See, we, this is motivated by false concepts of time. Time is a physical property subject to mass acceleration and gravity. We need to understand that time is not uniform or constant. Now nonlinearities, we can look at it like the straw that makes the camel's back, for example. What are na na natural calamities are like fires, floods, wars, and earthquakes. They intrude on in our lives. And uh, they, they come at, uh, uh, at really unpredictably, at, uh, uh, un unpredictable occasions for the most part. We have political nonlinearities. Empires fall, rise, whatever. Um, and rule once rule. It's interesting. If increased taxation and lavish spending could save an economy, a room would still rule the world. Empires rise and they fall. They don't, they're not around forever. And uh, we need to understand that. The average age of these, by the way, are about 200 years. Ooh, that's interesting. Physics have nonlinearities. They're things we call boundary conditions. Their conditions are true up until this point. We discover all through physics there are boundary conditions, nonlinearities. There are black holes. These are nonlinearities. In quantum mechanics, we've just looked at length, mass, energy, and time are quantized. And we have a, we're gonna, uh, we have a whole briefing pack on this called Beyond Perception. That's another one that we're going to uh, take another look at and freshen it up. It's, you know, now it's a decade old. We can modernize it a bit, just like we're doing beyond time and space here. In cosmology, we have the anthropic principle. We're going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute. When we attempt to model what we know about the physical universe, we discover that there are, hu there, are hu there are a huge number of factors that if you change them just an itty little bit, it makes life impossible. And it's not just two or three. There's dozens and dozens of these things, that some of which are so precise they have to be exactly where they are in one part in 10 to the 15th. That's hugely precise. So that all argues not only that it was designed, but there's somebody maintaining that design. That's something that many people overlook. Well, there's an ozone hole, and if it changes one, per one tenth of one percent, it's going to bring cosmic doom. Really? Who's balanced it all this time? That didn't happen by accident. Someone's watching that. Huh? Atomic physics. We have strong nuclear force, coupling constant. If you change it, atoms and materials disappear. We don't have them. a weak nuclear force coupling constant, electromagnetic coupling constant, the ratio of the electron to proton mass, the stability of the proton. Each one of these have ratios and numbers that if you change just a little bit, the periodic table disappears. You don't have metals. You don't have, you don't have anything. The fine structure, these are all constants. That last one's the one that bothers the physics the most, but anyway, we'll go on here. And uh, uh, there are certain atomic energy levels that are not only precise where they need to be, but uh, uh, Fred Boyle, uh, Hoyle uh, 
predicted a level that they then found because he predicted by applying this principle. The Earth, the surface gravity, if the gravity was any heavier, we'd have problems. If it was lighter, the thickness of the crust, the rotation of the period, the gravitational interaction with the Moon, the magnetic field of the Earth, the actual tilt, the albedo, that is the reflectivity of the Earth, the oxygen and nitrogen ratio, carbon dioxide and water, vapor levels, any one of these, if you change it just a little bit, things are either too, too hot or too cold, you have life is impossible. It's astonishing to discover how delicately these have to be balanced to have what we experience, including the ozone level, the atmospheric electric discharge. There's, there's hundreds of these. The seismic activities. You know the seismic activity is essential for life? It surprised me to learn this. And uh, the sun factors, the age of the sun, the distance from the center of the galaxy, its mass, its color, its distance from the Earth, all, all, uh, every one of those, if you change it a little bit, things are either too hot or too cold. You won't have life. You don't have the, the, carbon di uh, the hydrocarbon cycle to create life and so forth. And uh, so the universe itself, the gravitational coupling constant, the expansion rate of the universe, the entropy level, the mass of the universe, the uniformity, all of these require some sophistication in cosmology to appreciate, but what you discover when you start modeling, you change these just a little bit and the universe doesn't exist. It's astonishing. The number of stars, amazingly enough, the distance between the stars, those are all required. That's an amazing discovery. The rate of luminosity and so on. Now, there's another discovery that's more recent. That's the, all that I've just summarized, and we, we deal with that in another briefing back in detail, so I don't want to do it twice. We'll, uh, beyond uh, uh, um, coincidence is the, a study of the uniqueness of that, the anthropic principle, as it's called. And they call it the anthropic principle because it's as if the entire universe was designed for man. So secular scientists labeled it the anthropic principle. And it needed, you know, they may not realize how accurate they were. It was designed for man. Anyway, but there's another discovery that's more recent, but even, even just as provocative. And it has to do with the mathematical relationship between the sun and the moon and the earth that, where we discovered this. And that's the discovery of spectroscopy. It turns out the size of the earth, the moon, and the sun are such that you can have, when the moon gets in the way at just the right time, the moon's exactly the right size and distance. So that it will block out the sun to give you what we call a solar eclipse. But if the moon was a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger, you wouldn't be able to see the corona. And it was in seeing the corona that they discovered spectroscopy. And there's, that's a technique by which we can, uh, as we understand spectroscopy, we can, we, we can tell how much a star weighs, what it's made out of, uh, the whole field of astronomy comes out of a technology called spectroscopy, which was discovered because of the phenomenon of a solar eclipse. Well, you turn that around and you realize not only is the universe designed for man, it was designed to be discovered. It wasn't just designed to be effective in terms of the fundamentals. It was designed to be discovered. And uh, so our place in the galaxy happens to be in exactly the right place to be able to discover the galaxy. Um, we're uniquely and uh, there is uh, uh, Gonz uh, uh, Gonzalez and Richards have published a book called The Privileged Planet, How Our Place in the Cosmos Was Designed for Discovery, and they have a DVD out that's unbelievable, very well done, and it's an astonishing, it, it, it's astonishing thing to, uh, to behold, and, I, and uh, I don't want to spend our whole time on that, but we certainly could. They spend a whole DVD beautifully demonstrating, explaining the whole concept. But... Uh, now, that leads to another observation I want to make. One of the most astonishing characteristics of the biblical text is that it anticipates our technological advances. And we have a whole briefing on that called Technology in the Bible, or uh, satellites, uh, gigabytes and satellites, that the fact that uh, uh, worldwide television, digital, all, all kinds of things we take for granted were anticipated in the biblical text. The biblical text impacts our personal priorities even more deeply than just our intellect. And so I want to talk a little bit further about this in this study because this is really the second of a two-session thing. I want to wrap up the whole thing if I can. And that is the Bible is a message system. And that in itself is a discovery that you need to make personally. Sixty-six books that we call the Bible, penned by 40 authors over thousands of years, but with evidence of design from outside our time domain. You can prove, you can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. You've got to discover the integrity of that message system yourself and then you obviously have to confront the fact that it had to come from outside the dimensionality of time. And the gr I call this the grandest adventure possible, the journey of discovery between 
the miracle of our origin on the one hand and the mystery of our destiny on the other. That's the journey we're all on. And the Bible is our handbook, the only reliable one. So these nonlinearities in science, of course, deal, of course, through the Big Bang theories. The fact that, and we have a whole briefing on that with Genesis and the Big Bang and so forth. In the information sciences and in biology, we have Bishop Pally's fabulous watch example, often quoted, and the digital uh, context of one by land, two by say, Paul Revere, again, is digital. The DNA has made up a three out of four error correcting digital code. Many people don't, there's probably one engineer in a hundred that knows how to design a digital uh, uh, de detecting code. Uh, certainly uh, not uh, a error correcting code. And the DNA exploits a three out of four error correcting digital code. And the design skill there is far beyond the reach of most engineers. A few, maybe, I have it. And uh, so the DNA and the RNA are made of a three, it's a three out of four. I, I don't want to get into all that here. I just want to call your attention to get into that and realize the uh, distinctive nature of it. Now, um, if you want a more detailed discovery on all of these things, we, do, we deal with it in our commentary on the book of Genesis. We spend a full session on each day of creation and touch on most of these topics uh, in that area. And uh, there is a book out that is a recent book that I encourage you to get your hands on by Stephen Meyer called The Signature in the Cell. It gives you a whole history and explanation of what, uh, uh, of what really going on in uh, microbiology. It's very understandable. It's very dramatic. It's a, but it is staggering to realize that God's signature is written in our cells. And Stephen Meyer uh, does an excellent job uh, presenting that thing. He's going to be a speaker at our conference and so on. So let's talk about biblical nonlinearities. The fall of man. Genesis 3 is a gigantic nonlinearity. And that's where entropy is introduced. That's where light begins to slow down and so forth, we believe. And for, fall of man. Another nonlinearity, huge, is Noah's flood. What a shock the planet Earth had. The whole planet covered with water. All but eight people. And uh, that was warned for four generations. It didn't come as a surprise. For four generations it was preached on. And, uh, and of course we have another nonlinearity, Israel. It's exodus from Egypt. They went down as a family, came out as a nation. And the whole ups and downs and vicissitudes of the nation, all written in advance. And uh, yes, the diaspora, the Holocaust, all in the scripture, predicted in advance of the Assyrian conquest, the Babylonian captivity, and the Messiah. And that's probably the most astonishing uh, attribute um, in terms of trying to understand our position in time and space. And of course, the diaspora is recorded in the Torah and the regathering and so forth. It's interesting that this, this book that's in your lap has over 8,000 verses in it that are predictive in nature, that dealing with almost 2,000 predictions on over 700 different matters. This is by just one cataloging by J. Barton Payne in his Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy. Different experts might parse it slightly differently, but that's just one example. Clearly, the Bible isn't just a few pr prophecy verses. No, it is predictive from cover to cover in more, in more ways than you can discover in your lifetime. Let's just talk about the prophecies in the Scripture that are quoted in the Gospels. There's many more we've experienced, but just take the ones that are specifically quoted in the Gospels. That Jesus, was, that Messiah was going to be of David's family. It's all through the Old Testament. That he would be born of a virgin is all through several places. He would be born in Bethlehem in Micah 5.2. He would sojourn in Egypt, Hosea 11.1. He would live in Galilee, in fact, specifically in Nazareth, in Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11. He would be announced by an Elijah-like herald, according to several passages. That would occasion the massacre of Bethlehem's children, we did learn in Genesis 35 and Jeremiah 31. He'd proclaim a jubilee to the world. His mission would include the Gentiles. That's not a surprise. That was described by uh, several places in the Old Testament, Isaiah 42 being an example. His ministry would be one of healing. We take that for granted because it's so familiar to us. No, that was predicted in Isaiah 53. He would teach through parables. That's in the Old Testament. He would be disbelieved and rejected by the rulers. That's no surprise. It's described several times in the Psalms and several times in the book of Isaiah, among other places. 
Let's continue some others. Let's talk just the last week of Christ's uh, ministry, the last week of his earthly walk here. He'd make a triumphal entry in Jerusalem, according to Zechariah 9.9 and Psalm 118. He'd be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. He would be uh, like a smitten shepherd. His people would be scattered. He'd be given vinegar and gall. We've got this, the, even the, uh, the technical details. They'd cast lots for his garments. His side would be pierced. Not a bone would be broken, however. He would die among malefactors. His dying words were foretold in Psalm 22 and Psalm 31. He'd be buried by a rich man. He'd rise from the dead on the third day. And by the way, how many times in the Old Testament do you find that? Certainly Genesis 22.4, that's indicated. Psalm 16, that's indicated. And uh, Jonah, chapter 1, verse 7, interestingly enough, that's the one that Jesus himself alludes to. Hosea 6, and there's also an interesting passage in Judges 2. I keep finding more of those, by the way. They rise on the third day. It's, all, it's laced all through the Old Testament picture. His resurrection will be followed by the destruction of Jerusalem. That was all predicted. Now, the big one that is coming in front of us. Talk about nonlinearity. It's a period of history written in advance about which the Bible says more than any other and into which we are being propelled at the present time. A seven-year period is on the horizon. A, spe a specific seven-year period that's going to include a time of trouble the likes of which the world had never seen before and never would see again. It's coming. We're on the, 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 this huge nonlinearity forthcoming. In Babylon, the Magog invasion, and a coming surprise ahead of the Magog invasion, Psalm 83. I invite you to check all of these out. We've written briefing packages on Babylon, on the Magog invasion, and, and on Psalm 83 and so forth. Boy, you're talking about Jerusalem, Temple, Europe, China, they're all laid out in the Scripture. And the greatest nonlinear event of all time is forthcoming. Every detail of the genealogy, birth, mission, and destiny of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was written down in detail centuries before their realization in history. Bear it down. Understand a basic premise here. The Old Testament was translated into Greek 270 years before Christ was born. Call it three centuries before his ministry. You can verify that in any competent encyclopedia. The Old Testament, whoever wrote it, whatever, was translated into Greek three centuries. That's a matter of documentation. Yet, in that text, the precise day that he was to present himself as a king, riding on a donkey, was predicted centuries in advance. That's staggering to realize that's just a reality you can verify. And there's no other way to explain it than to acknowledge the supernatural origin of the total package, not just a, a little check verse here and there. And so for the most amazing passage in the Bible and the remarkable validation of his mission, you want to study um, the, the, this, this passage. And you find it in Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. You'll also find a special briefing called Daniel 70 Weeks that goes into this and it's probably, Jesus himself pointed his disciples to that very passage, Daniel 9, uh, as, the, uh, as the key to end time prophecy. Okay. But what else is going on today? You know, we have a whole briefing on technology in the Bible. Two hours of listing things that have been, that we take for granted in advanced technology. We're laid out in the Bible ahead of time. It's a whole study on its own. There's another one, Luke 21. Everybody thinks Luke 21 is part of the Olivet Discourse. Discourse. No, it's not. It was given in the temple. And be, until people recognize that, you'll fail to recognize that Jesus has a prophecy that most people have overlooked. He laid out the details of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD with a precision that confuses many of the critics. Ezekiel 37 talks about Israel reestablishing as a country, as a, its own state. Isaiah raised question, can a nation be born in a day? Yes, it was. The fact that Israel is in the news every day is a testimony as a fulfillment. Not complete yet, but a partial fulfillment. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 4, there's a complex analysis there that predicts the exact day, the exact day that, 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 Jesus, that uh, Israel would be born as a state. And that's, that's too complicated. It's a study in its own right. We deal with it in our Ezekiel commentary. 
And Ezekiel 38, the Gog and Magog. Everyone's talking these days about Gog and Magog because they see a lot of the pieces ready to happen. And indeed they are. Not necessarily next month. There's some preceding events that have to take place. But it is certainly on our horizon. It's a, it's a major geopolitical uh, issue on the horizon. The role of Russia and Iran and, and, the, and the hatred of Israel and so forth. But there's Psalm 83 that may be an intervening thing that it may be on our more immediate horizon. The only way to answer these things, I, could, I don't want to derail our whole study here on this topic, but uh, off it goes. Because I have something else I want to get into here. We've been talking a lot about uh, atomic particles and scientific things. I don't want to leave us there. I want us to come back to what this is really all about, and that's our coming king. And this little tour de force that I want to indulge here was inspired by Pastor Lockridge some years ago. Speaking of our coming king, he's the king of the Jews. He's a racial king. You know, pe uh, 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 people wonder why there's a menorah in our house. Are you guys Jewish? No, but the God we worship is. You see. He's the king of Israel. Jesus is the king. He's a national king. Many people don't realize that. He's king of all the ages, the king of heaven, the king of glory, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. The question is, do you know him? Do you really know him? He's a prophet before Moses, a priest after Melchizedek, a champion like Joshua. He's a uh, offering in the place of Isaac, a king from the line of David, a, a wise counselor even above Solomon. He's be he was beloved, rejected, and exalted son like Joseph, and of course, far more. The heavens declare his glory. The ferment shows his handiwork. He who is, who was, and always will be the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tau in the Hebrew, and the A and the Z in our alphabet. He's the first fruits of them that slept. He's the Ego Ami, the Ichyach Asher Ichyach, the I Am that I Am, the voice of the burning bush, the captain of the Lord's host. He was the conqueror of Jericho. He's enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful, imperially powerful, impartially merciful. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the very God of the very God. He's our kinsman redeemer, but he's also our avenger of blood. He's our city of refuge, our performing high priest, our personal prophet, our reigning king. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of theology. And he's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the miracle of all the ages, the per superlative of everything good. You and I are the beneficiaries of a love letter that was written in blood on a wooden cross erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. They say he was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. By him were all things made that were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. And by him are all things held together. Wow. What held him to that cross? What held him to the cross? It wasn't the nails. See, at any time he could have said, enough already, I'm out of here. What held him to the cross? It wasn't the nails. It was his love for you and me. That's why he went through with it. Three times he prayed, to, if there's any other, way, any other way to take it, let's take it. Three times. If there's any other way, then by him, his prayer wasn't answered. He was born of a woman, so you and I could be born of God. He humbled himself so that we could be lifted up. He became a servant so that we could be made joint heirs with him. Wow. He suffered rejection so that we could become his friends. He denied himself so that we could freely receive all things. He gave himself so that he could bless us in every way. He's available to the tempted and tried. He blesses the young. He cleanses the lepers. He defends the feeble. He delivers the captives. He discharges the debtors. He forgives the sinners. He franchises the meek. He guards the besieged. He heals the sick. He provides strength to the weak. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He serves the unfortunate. He sympathizes and he saves. His offices are manifold. His reign is righteousness. His promises are sure. His goodness is limitless. His light is matchless. His grace is sufficient. His love never changes. His mercy is everlasting. His word is enough. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. I wish I could describe them to you. 
He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's irresistible. And he's invincible. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Man cannot explain him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but soon learned they couldn't stop him. The personal representative of the ruler of the world, then, couldn't find any fault with him. The witnesses couldn't agree against him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. The grave couldn't hold him. He's always been and always will be. He had no predecessor and will have no successor. You can't impeach him and he isn't going to resign. <laughs> His name is above every name. That at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is, His is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So what about your personal nonlinearity? The real you. I can't see the real you. I just see the containers you happen to be in right now. The real you. Call it soul, heart, spirit, whatever. It's software, not hardware, which means it's without mass, which means it has no time. You are eternal whether you're saved or not. Wow. That's the problem. Where are you going to spend your eternity? If you're perfect, no problem. <laughs> Ironside talks about a door. I love this. I remember I got picked this up as a teenager. I've loved it. Imagine that you're confronted with a doorway labeled, Whosoever will may enter. Now you've got complete freedom to go through that door or not. You can go in or not. It's up to you. You choose to enter. And when you go through that door, you look back and you're shocked. On the other side, you find a banquet table set with individual place settings, names on each place. And there's a place with your name on it. You are expected. And you turn back and look at the door you just came through. And it, on this side it says, foreordained before the foundation of the world. I love that. I want to do that to our entrance here, you know, put it. But the security people say, you know, <laughs> it, it, we'd be denying because we lock the doors at night, right? Anyway, how do you tell if you've been predestinated? There's a big discussion about predestination. How do you tell? Very simple. Choose him and he will demonstrate that you were. Yet it really is up to you. It's only a paradox when you look at it from within the time domain. So I want to put a challenge before you before we finish, because for many of you this may be your, our first encounter together. And I like to put this up on the screen, because if you accept what I put here, you flunk the chorus. I want you to challenge this outrageous statement I'm going to put on the screen. You and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now that's a preposterous statement, that you and I are moving into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about the gospel period. That's a preposterous statement. I sincerely believe it, but I want you to challenge. If you accept it, you flunk. I want you to challenge that statement. How do you do that? You've got to do two things. You've got to find out what the Bible actually says. Not what Chuck Missler says or anybody else. Find out. For, it's too important to delegate to anybody else. It's written specifically to you personally. Now, in our unique environment today, you can do that more easily than ever before in history. You can go to the original Hebrew and Greek without knowing Hebrew or Greek. With the appliances we have, the computers, the iPhones, whatever, you can get into the text, into the Greek or Hebrew without knowing Greek or Hebrew because of the advanced appliances that we all have, and the Internet. You can put your little error on any word. It'll pop up what, what it said in the original, and, and it'll tell you the parts of speech. It'll even diagram the sentences if you want to. And the software to do that is free for your computer. You can do it on the Internet. It's free on the Blue Letter Bible and there's some other services. If you're not in a small group, you're not really serious about the Bible. Somebody says, gee, I'm really into the Bible. Great. Are you studying the Bible in a small group during the week? Are you depending on a 40-minute sermon on Sunday morning as designed to the general public? That's not going to cut the mustard. No matter how good the pastor is, no matter how effective the message is, that isn't going to do it. You need to be in the Word of God, in a, and the best way to do that in a small group. Small enough that you can ask questions without embarrassment. Small enough to hold each other accountable. And the second thing you've got to do is not as easy as that. Find out what's really going on. You can't on the 10 o'clock news. Because one thing I think everyone's learned today, the, me the media is so corrupt, they take pride in shaping opinions rather than informing them. 
So you got to do, you got to avail yourself of some resources here. Pilate said, what is truth? That's our challenge. What is really true? We live in the age of deceit. So that's a challenge. And there are resources I want to make you acquainted with to help do that. So you say, well, what do I do then, Chuck? Well, the first question is, what's your action plan? A year from now, are you going to look back? Will you have grown a year or will you just repeat one year's experience another time? After 10 years, do you have one year's experience repeated 10 times or you really progress? What is God calling you to do? That's the question every one of us needs to determine. How many of you are saved? Let me see a show of hands. What have you done with it? Why did God save you? To accomplish something, to bear fruit. What, have you, what fruit have you borne? I'm going to suggest that every one of us, me included, needs to raise the bar on our personal walk. And that may involve a number of things. I know what it'll include, and that's a, to be committed to a systematic study to the, of, of the Word of God. And so either, you either join or start, if you need to, a weekly small study group. You don't have to be a teacher to lead a group. There's plenty of resources. You can invite a group of people over and pop a DVD in the thing and serve some coffee and donuts and just discuss it. That's all you have to do. The Holy Spirit will take over. You don't have to be a teacher to lead a group. You just make sure one person doesn't dominate. You know, you, you maintain some order in here. But whatever you're going to do, respond to his calling now. Now is the time. So with that... Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. I've been reviewing Beyond Time and Space. And if this is your first encounter with some of the materials, we invite you to take up any of these topics that have tickled your interest and know that there's further studies behind them. And perhaps one of the best places to start is just learn the Bible in 24 hours, which touches on most of these topics in a surprising amount of de detail. Uh, from there you go into commentaries and your, whatever favorite books the Lord puts in your path. But I encourage you to do it through the Institute because then you can get university credit for it and a lot of other things you'll discover. As you, if you get a little copy of the little blue handbook, it explains all that. The handbook is free. They're available. Uh, it'll explain how this peculiar entity has emerged and what it does. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. We would pray, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives as each of us commit our way into your hands without any reservations whatsoever. We commit ourselves in your hands in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen.